so welcome back. Um, in case you're wondering what happened there, uh, why my other video ended a little bit earlier, well, um, sometimes these videos are shot with on battery power and the battery just ran out. So that was my fault. But I thought rather than throw the whole thing out, um, might as well use the part that was okay and then just pick up where I left off. So welcome back. Um, this is lecture 23B, which is the one that's going to cover El Nino and La Nina. And let's jump in. So when we talk about El Nino and La Nina, the key thing that we need to understand is the average flow that occurs in the equatorial Pacific, because that's actually where El Nino and La Nina even take place. They take place in the equatorial Pacific. So the average circulation, the average conditions are defined by something called the Walker circulation. And the Walker circulation is what we look at when we determine, are we in an El Nino? Are we in a La Nina? Are we in neutral conditions? What's going on? And we look at this Walker circulation. So here's how the Walker circulation works. Go back to lecture 23A, and we talked a little bit about something called the trade winds. Near the equator, winds are blowing on average from the east to the west. Well, as they blow across the Pacific Ocean, they carry substantial amounts of warm water from the East Pacific over to the West Pacific. As a result, the ocean waters over the West Pacific are pretty warm. On the other hand, the ocean waters over the Eastern Pacific aren't nearly as warm. They're substantially cooler. Now, as a result, in the Western Pacific, there's more rising air because there's just more heat and therefore there's lower pressure and stormier weather. On the other hand, in the Eastern Pacific, the waters are a lot cooler. Cooler air sinks. As a result, there's more sinking air, higher pressure, and drier weather in the Eastern Pacific. And we get this circulation that forms between the trade winds blowing from east to west, rising air in the west, sinking air in the east, and then high up in the atmosphere aloft, winds then again blow from west to east. It looks something like this circulation right here. So you have cooler water in the east, therefore you get sinking air in dry weather. On the other hand, near the west, you get warmer water and rising air. And this is a typical Walker circulation. Now, how does this relate to El Nino and La Nina and so on? Well, let's talk about the normal conditions first, the average conditions. And I'm just going to use a slang term for this. I'm going to call it La Nada. Um, I didn't come up with that. Um, a mentor of mine, his name is Sean Chamberlain, came up with that. But I'm going to take Dr. Chamberlain's idea and run with it. So. La nada is the slang term I'm going to use for just the normal situation. La nada means the nothing. So in this case, we're neither in El Nino conditions or La Nina conditions. These are also referred to as neutral conditions. Now, as we've begun to really understand what's going on in the equatorial Pacific more and more, we've realized that really... Lanata is just sort of an in-between. It's, it's sort of a transitional phase between El Niños and La Niñas. And it's actually believed that the Eastern Pacific or the Equatorial Pacific as a whole is in a constant state of change where one year it's an El Niño, next year it's a La Niña, next year it's neutral, and so on. However, in this non-El Niño, non-La Niña, in-between setup, we get trade winds that blow from east to west and they carry warm water from east to west. And again, this results in cool air over the east, which sinks, warm air over the west, which rises. 
And it looks something like this. And this is the typical setup in the equatorial Pacific. You have lots of warm air over the western Pacific, and it rises, creating stormy weather. Meanwhile, over the eastern Pacific, you have lots of sinking air, and therefore it's very calm and very dry. Now, in an El Nino situation, this walker circulation becomes disrupted for whatever reason, and we're not fully sure why. I mean, there's some guesses and, and there's some things that go into this, but what happens in an El Nino situation, those trade winds that blow from east to west weaken, and in some cases, even reverse. And this allows that water that was hanging out over the Eastern Pacific to stay over the Eastern Pacific. And so warm water begins to build up in the Eastern Pacific. As a result, the Eastern Pacific becomes warmer than normal, whereas the Western Pacific becomes colder than normal. And it looks something like this. In this case, and this is just a comparison to average. In this case, the waters over the Eastern Pacific are substantially warmer than they normally are. As a result, there's stormier weather, there's more heat, more rising air, lower pressure, and therefore, the pattern over here in the Eastern Pacific becomes substantially more active. On the other hand, in the West Pacific, the waters are on average cooler than normal. And as a result, there's not as much rising air. Instead, there's more sinking air. Therefore, the weather here is typically a lot drier. Now, if you take a look at this and you compare to the Walker circulation, which was a few slides ago, in a real sense, the Walker circulation reverses. In the normal walker circulation, winds blow from east to west, then they rise, blow from west to east, and then they sink again. Here you have a complete reversal of that situation. Now, how do meteorologists actually identify when there's an El Nino and when there's a La Nina? Well, what I'm showing you right now is what's called a profile, a data set of temperature and temperature anomalies. So here's what this means. This upper panel represents ocean temperatures, average ocean temperatures, average sea surface temperatures over the equatorial Pacific. Here's the equator. This end over here is the eastern Pacific. And in fact, just so you'll remember that, I will write that down. Um, different one, pen. And let me use black. Okay. And this is the Eastern Pacific. If you're a little confused because you see a W there, make sure that you do the longitude and latitude exercise this week and maybe that'll help alleviate things a little bit. But the larger this number is, the further west you're getting away from the prime meridian. So this is the eastern end. This is the least west. This, this is the lowest western numbers, which is the east. Meanwhile, over here on this end, this is the western Pacific. So I'll just write WPAC for western Pacific. Okay, so here's how this works. This first panel shows you average sea surface temperatures. Blues, greens, and yellows represent cooler water, where oranges and reds and browns represent warmer water. In this particular data set, taken November 2015, and I'll mention why I'll use this data set, shows a pretty warm body of ocean water right here in the Central Pacific, right in between 180 and 160 west. So this is really in the Central Pacific. And the coolest waters are over here, 
in the Eastern Pacific. Now on the other hand, this map down here shows sea surface temperature anomalies. Now an anomaly is a departure from average, so it's the difference from the average. So basically what we do is we take this plot here and we subtract it from the average to get this plot. And so this tells us where the water temperatures are warmer than normal and where they're cooler than normal. And if you actually take a look in this particular setup, we have a substantial pool of warmer than average water, in some cases higher than three degrees Celsius warmer, building up here over the Eastern Pacific. Now, one other thing I'll mention real quick before I move on is these arrows here represent wind anomalies. These are wind observations. These down here are wind anomalies. And what these actually are showing us is that the wind here is blowing much further to the west, or sorry, much further to the east than normal. In a normal situation, winds blow from east to west. Here, though, these anomalies are showing winds that are predominantly blowing from west to east. So that's another indication of an El Nino. We have warmer than average water in the eastern Pacific, and we have these very strong west to east wind anomalies. And so this is a classic textbook El Nino situation. And so this is what we look at. We look at where are the winds blowing, or where are the winds not where blah, where are the wind anomalies blowing? And here they're blowing primarily from west to east. And what kind of ocean temperature anomalies are we seeing? If we're seeing tremendous warm anomalies in the eastern Pacific, then that's a telltale sign of an El Nino. Now, El Nino also has a reverse situation. We call it La Nina, and I'll get to La Nina in a second, but in the case of a La Nina, this area here would experience cooler than average ocean temperatures. Now, El Nino doesn't just affect us here on the West Coast. We're, we're used to going, oh, El Nino, lots of rain, but actually El Nino has global impacts, and not everybody gets the same impacts. Whereas we here on the West Coast experience a lot more wet weather, a lot more rainfall, usually it's slightly warmer. People on the Western Pacific, near East Asia, Indonesia, and Australia, Remember, they normally get that rising air and stormy weather. Well, guess what? They aren't getting that now. Instead, it's much cooler and you have sinking air. So the weather here becomes a lot drier than normal. And then this map shows you other consequences of El Nino across the globe. We're mainly going to focus here on the West Coast, though. On the West Coast, we have a strengthened jet stream which then gives us wetter weather here in the southern part of the United States. In the northern part, they typically experience warmer and drier weather. It's not as wet, not as cold. Now, the opposite happens too. As I mentioned, El Nino has a counterpart. The opposite of El Nino is what we call La Nina. La Nina means the girl, whereas El Nino means the boy. La Nina means the girl. Now, in the case of a La Nina, rather than weakening, the trade winds strengthen. They become greater than normal. We experience strong trade wind anomalies. They, as I just mentioned, they become greater than normal. And therefore, they blow additional warm water to the West Pacific. As a result, the walker circulation becomes stronger. You have more sinking air over the East Pacific, more rising air over the West Pacific. Even drier weather in the East Pacific, even wetter weather in the West Pacific. And it looks something like this. And this is taken from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And what this actually shows is that in a, in a La Nina situation, 
You have cooler than average waters here in the Eastern Pacific, warmer than average waters here in the Western Pacific, and as a result, you have even stormier than average weather, even stormier than average weather in the Western Pacific, and even drier than average weather in the Eastern Pacific. Now, La Nina's consequences are usually flipped from El Nino. The locations that were wet are dry. The locations that were dry are wet. Here's our consequences here. Usually the southern half of the United States becomes a lot drier during La Nina, whereas the northern half of the United States becomes a lot wetter. Now, La Nina has other consequences as well, as does El Nino. In the case of a La Nina, the waters here over the Pacific, over the Eastern Pacific, are usually a lot colder. And what that actually leads to is there's less tropical storms that form down here. Now we're going to talk more about tropical storms in a couple of modules, so hang on for that. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the California drought, because people have asked me, and, and I've had discussions with people about, did El Nino cause it? Did La Nina cause it? What, was there some Nino Nina thing that caused it? And the fact is, is that the California drought basically transcended all of that. It persisted through all of that. So... It really wasn't impacted by an El Nino or a La Nina or a La Nada or anything like that. The California drought actually occurred due to something else. So here's what actually happened. Um, I mentioned in a few lectures ago about something called the jet stream. And the jet stream is this high upper level winds that blow air from west to east. Now, one of the things I did not mention is that there are things called ridges and troughs in this jet stream. The jet stream is never just a straight line. Rather, it wiggles quite a bit. And this wiggle here actually represents what's called a ridge what's called a ridge. And in the case of a ridge, basically what happens is all of the wet weather that we would normally get, all of the storms that cause this wet weather, as they were approaching the west coast of the United States, traveled up and over the United States via this ridge. This basically prevented any storm systems that we would have gotten from reaching us. And as a result, we didn't get much rain. Now something else happened too. This ridge and the jet stream as a whole represents a boundary between warm air to the south and cold air to the north. Well, when this ridge is present, what that does is that allows more warm air to push north. So areas along the west coast of the United States weren't only dry, but they also experienced record warm temperatures. Record warm temperatures. I'm talking 80s and 90s in January. I can remember I was living in Southern California during this drought, and I can remember seeing palm trees on fire in the middle of January. That's insane. And what basically fed into this drought, though, was... This warmer air led to warmer water over the northern Pacific, and it created something called the blob. And a lot of people are wondering, and I'm wondering as well, did the blob and did this ridge basically feed off of each other? Because the warmer the water below, the warmer the air above, the greater likelihood you're going to get of these ridges. And so this blob basically allowed for this ridge to persist. 
if this blob had not developed, there's a good chance that the ridge wouldn't have been as strong as it was or wouldn't have lasted as long as it did. But this is kind of a chicken and the egg kind of question. Did we have the blob before the ridge or did we have the blob after the ridge? Which came first, the blob or the ridge? And we're still trying to figure that out. Now, one other question that I'll answer before I end this lecture. Something a lot of people have wondered about with the California drought in particular is, was it caused by climate change? My answer isn't going to be the most satisfying because my answer is, we're not sure yet. The fact of the matter is, is that this particular anomaly, this particular event was in geological time and in climatological time, it was a short term event. It, 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 it occurred over a four year time period, which that's a long time period. But is it long enough for us to say that it's a new norm or not? Well, we're going to have to take a look over the next 10, 15, 20 years and see if these blobs and these ridges end up becoming much more common. Now, there is some evidence that climate change and global warming have caused a wavier jet stream, more of these ridges, more blobs like this, and, and hence these droughts. But again, it's too early to tell. So as much as I want to say, yeah, it was climate change's fault, unfortunately, can't say that yet. But it'll be interesting to see over the next 5, 10, 15 years what actually does come of this. Um, the other thing I'll mention, when I talked about El Nino a few minutes ago, um, here in Northern California, where I assume all of you are from, if you're taking my class at De Anza College, you're in Northern California, um, El Nino gave you guys a lot of rain. However, I'm from Southern California, and El Nino was supposed to be our climate savior in a way. It was supposed to give us all kinds of rain, and it didn't. Why didn't it? Well, I only have two answers to that. Um, the first answer is, as much as we wanted it to rain, um, El Ninos only give us a snapshot of what could potentially happen. Not all, not all El Ninos are alike. Some El Ninos can make it much wetter. Some El Ninos can have very little impact on overall precipitation. The other thing is we are living in a much warmer world than we were even 20, 30 years ago. And some scientists have actually thought and again, the jury's still kind of out on this, that this may have influenced the global circulation of the atmosphere, including this jet stream and this, this whole setup here. And it's actually hypothesized, it's, it's thought that this may have taken the jet stream track that normally is strengthened during an El Nino and pushed it further north, therefore keeping SoCal dry. But again, is this a new norm? I can't really say. I, I'm, I'm really sorry I, I don't have the answer to that. What I will say is that time will tell. But I'm really not looking forward to the prognosis. I think that we are going to see more events like this in the future. Anyway, that's it for this lecture. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Until next